Um, okay, everyone, uh, it's 9.01, let's start. Um, uh, good morning and welcome to recitation 3 for 11.705. Um, today we are going to talk about some of the optimization techniques that we generally follow in deep learning and some of the tuning methods that we generally opt for when we are trying to gain different accuracies, gain higher accuracies in our network. Um, before I start, uh, just a quick show of hands. Who here have completed homework one, part one, and have started with homework one, part two? Two. Um, okay, who here have not uh, completed homework one, part one, but have still started with homework one, part two? Okay. Um, just a reminder, homework one, part two will take some time because they, we are not going to provide you any starter code for it, and it is really, really important that you start with it, and Homework one part two is much more fun than homework one part one. So um, it's, uh, it's recommended that you start early. Um, so the notebook that we are going to cover in this recitation has already been uploaded on this particular, uh, on our GitHub uh, repository. Um, you can go to the link and just open it. If you want, the slides will be uploaded on the website as soon as we uh, get over with the recitation. Um, so starting with uh, different optimization techniques, let's start with uh, SGD. Um, so what we have done till now in the lectures as well is we are doing gradient descent. And what gradient descent generally does is, let's assuming that you have n samples in your training data, what you are doing is you are, we are uh, uh, feeding all those n samples together in your network. You calculate the gradients, you calculate the loss, you calculate the gradients with respect to all the uh, training examples that you have, and then you divide your gradients by the total number of examples in, a, uh, in your data set, and then you back propagate, and then you update your uh, layer. But the thing is, uh, and, and this generally, this thing is known as, the thing that you are calculating is known as uh, true gradients. Now, this, this thing that we are uh, forward propagating the entire data set together is impractical, because as you are going to see in the homeworks as well, the data set that you'll have is generally very large. So it is not feasible for you to feed the entire data set at once, calculate the gradients, because for one, it'll not even load in memory, and for two, it, if it doesn't load in memory, there's no point of talking about what will happen later. Um, of course, because of the space constraints and the time constraints as well. So instead of finding true gradients, what we try and do is just find a stochastic estimate uh, of the gradients. And by, by stochastic estimate, what I mean is instead of uh, uh, forward propagating the entire data that we have, we randomly sample a small subset of the data from the entire data set, and then we keep on uh, forward propagating that and keep on updating our gradients based on the sample of the data or the subset of the data that we put in our model. Now, this division of the data that we have, the uh, random sampling of certain sa random sampling of uh, examples from the data set, uh, is uh, uh, is known as um, uh, a way to create mini batches. Now, mini batches basically means that you are uh, just sampling from the data set and uh, and have a subset of the data set. And now, instead of total number of examples uh, n, now let's suppose you have total number of examples m. And similar to gradient descent, what you do in stochastic gradient descent is also uh, forward propagate, calculate the loss, and when you're back propagating and updating the gradients, instead of dividing it by the total number of examples n, you divide it by the total number of uh, examples you had in the subset, which is m. And uh, that's what uh, the third equation in this particular slide means, is the gradient and the, it's the stochastic estimate of the gradient that we are doing. Uh, so, uh, it, it, and this is generally known as mini-batch mini uh, gradient descent. Um, now, why it's better than one single example uh, is that because what, what we could have done is instead of even sampling random examples, we could have sent the examples one by one uh, in our network, calculated the gradient, and then updated our model. But uh, for one, the, the main problem is that it is going to take a lot of time. And also given the fact that we now have uh, GPUs and modern techniques, um, uh, we can make use of CUDA and uh, multiply matrices faster. So it's better that you supply a batch of your examples so that you're able to multiply matrices faster and make use of that. Um, so the update rule is pretty similar to what we have seen so far. It's just the gradients, uh, uh, the weights are updated by, uh, the gradients that you calculate are, calculate are first multiplied by a learning rate, and then you add or subtract them uh, uh, based on your, uh, your performing ascent or descent. Um, 
Now, this uh, learning rate is uh, denoted by eta here, and that basically means uh, um, that you are scaling up or scaling down your gradients. Uh, but why uh, exactly is it important to scale up or scale down is only because of the fact that now, instead of finding the true gradients, we are finding stochastic estimates of the gradients. So the gradients that you are calculating, they are not the original gradients that we are supposed to do that. So instead of just directly subtracting, you, you scale it down or you scale it up, and then you subtract or add. Uh, in your main equation. Um, now, in a vanilla uh, stochastic gradient descent, the, per, this value of learning rate, this eta, is fixed. Um, but, the, but the thing is, it, do, do you guys think that it is good that it, the value of eta is fixed? Um, generally, in vanilla uh, stochastic gradient descent, this eta is a fixed scalar. Um, uh, anyone, anyone has any idea that it, will it be good or would it be bad or can we, can we change that? Or do we want to change that? Mm -hmm. So essentially, after a point, if, suppose if we have learning rate point 0.1, mm -hmm. and we are just point zero zero five away from the error, mm -hmm. so we will just keep on wobbling around the local minima and might not reach it ever. That's a good point. Uh, the fact that we once we start moving towards the local minima, we want to reduce the gradients through which we are updating our particular weight so that we stop and we don't overshoot. Uh, also, the fact that the gradients that we have uh, are multi-dimensional. Of course, they're two-dimensional in case of if, if you're considering a single weight matrix, they're two-dimensional. Now, the values, the gradients that we calculate for each neuron in a particular layer, they might not be the same. Now, what we are doing, it is possible that um, some of the gradients in, in the weight matrix, in the gradient matrix that we calculate, they are high and some are low. But what we're doing right now is we're multiplying it with all the gradients with a simple scalar, which is not good and which is possibly not going to give you the optimum solution. Um, and, when we, and then we are going to discuss uh, what are the different techniques that through which we can uh, change this. Um, also, uh, currently, what we are doing is we are averaging the gradients that we are calculating for each batch so that we are able to get the loss for each training example uh, uh, because we are averaging it. Instead, what we can also do is uh, once we are passing the entire batch in our model and once we calculate the gradients and once we are calculating the entire loss for each of the example in the batch, uh, we can also sum that. And uh, in that case, we'll be getting the loss for the entire batch and we'll not be getting the loss for a particular single training example. And it depends on the task that you're performing. So there's no correct way of saying that you should always do the average uh, over all the loss values that you calculate for a particular batch. You can also sum them and then see how it goes. But of course, when you're summing the value, it, uh, the, when you're summing the values, the, your loss is going to depend on the batch size as well. Because if you have more examples, the sum is going to be more. However, if you're taking average, it does not really matter what your batch size is. It could be 16, 32, 64. It should really start from the same thing. Um, so the problem that we just discussed, the, the fact that we have a fixed, uh, fixed um, learning rate could be changed if uh, 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 is not something that we should be really following. So instead, we also have a different kind of uh, optimization technique, which is known as R-prop, or resilient backpropagation. Um, now, now, as we mentioned, that the gradients are going to be two-dimensional. I mean, for, for a particular weight matrix, let's, con let's consider that we have a weight matrix, and then we are find, trying to find the gradients for it. So the gradients are also going to be two-dimensional for it. Now, um, the number of uh, rows in that particular matrix is, of course, going to depend on the neurons in the layer that we have preceding and the uh, latter layer. But the thing is, if you are going to apply the same learning rate to all parameters is not good. Because let's suppose that your gradients are sparse. Let's suppose that you have 10 rows in your gradient matrix. And out of that, the top five have a particular value, a particular gradient. And the rest five, they are pretty, sim they're pretty close to 0, which basically means that the weight update that you should be doing for the last five neurons in that layer should be negligible. However, the weight update that you should be doing for the first five neurons in that layer should be a particular amount. So how, but the thing is, because we have a scalar learning rate, you will be multiplying that particular gradient. How, if it's zero, it doesn't really matter because you'll not be updating it. However, if it's close to zero, if you don't want a large update, but you want a small update, you'll still multiply it with the same learning rate, which might lead to a convergence problem, which might lead to you not really reaching the global minima. Um, as we are going to see in the later uh, part of the course as well, the problem of vanishing gradients and the problem of exploding gradients uh, are pretty common. Exploding gradients being common in recurrent networks and uh, uh, vanishing gradients being very common in a deeper network because as um, uh, we'll discuss it. Um, so 
because the fact that we don't want a scalar uh, learning rate, what we can do is we can adaptively change that learning rate based on the gradients that we are calculating. Now, let's in our prop, what we do is the uh, uh, assuming that you are doing full batch gradient descent. Now, in full batch gradient descent, you know the true gradient. Now, once you know the true gradient, you know that for that particular epoch, what's the exact amount of update that I should be doing for each of the different network, uh, for each of the different neuron, and for each of the different weight matrix. So what we can do, if we know the true gradient, we know that this particular neuron is not, does not need to be updated that much, and so that we can set the uh, value of the learning rate appropriately. Um, what, we, what we do in our prop is just we see the sign of the past two gradients, and we see if the past two gradients are, if the sign are positive, let's suppose if, if I calculate the gradient, and they're positive. If I again calculate the gradient, they're again positive, which basically means that we are going in the same direction. So we need to scale up our learning rate. And by scale up, that means we need to increase our learning rate so that we are able to reach the global uh, minima, all the global optima in the, means in the loss surface faster. However, if the sign changes, it basically means that we have, uh, we overshoot it. And then because, uh, uh, because the gradients have changed signs, basically means that you need to scale down the learning rate and move forward. Um, so this is applicable only if you have true gradients, right? Because if we know the true gradients, then only we know the exact amount of change that we need to make in our learning rate. But as, as we discussed, this is not generally the case. Um, and our prop fails with mini batch training. And uh, uh, here's an example that really uh, shows how, why it's going to fail. So let's suppose you have 10,000 training samples and you chose a batch size of 100. So you have 10 batches that you're going to feed. Now, out of those 10 batches, let's assume that for the first nine batches, you are getting a weight update, a, a gradient of plus 0.1. So you're getting a gradient of plus 0.1, plus 0.1, plus 0.1, nine times. So that basically means that you need to update it uh, plus 0.9. And for the final batch, you got a gradient of minus 0.9. So this basically means that uh, the gradient for this update, this entire epoch, shouldn't be that much because it effectively, it cancels it out. So it should be zero. And you should not be updating your network much. But in mini batch training, what you will be doing is you will see the first two samples, and because the uh, s uh, because the sign of the first two uh, gradients are positive, you are going to scale up and you are going to increase the learning rate, which is going to further deteriorate the performance of your uh, network because you're not doing the exact same thing because you don't really know what's going to happen after, and that's where our prop is generally not uh, really useful in cases in which we have uh, uh, in which we do mini batch uh, descent. Um, so a different solution for that is instead of doing RPROP, what we can do is RMS prop. And RMS prop beautifully captures the fact that instead of looking at the signs, what we can, what we can and what we should be doing is we should be computing the running mean of the gradients that we are calculating. And uh, what it does is if we are seeing that the running mean uh, is positive, is the running mean is basically increasing and increasing, then we basically mean that we are getting closer and closer and we need to decrease and scale down our learning rate. So the equation that has been mentioned here, what we are doing is we, uh, the gradients are inversely proportional to the expectation of our gradients. And that expectation is nothing but the running means that we are having. So as, as we are getting positive gradients and positive gradients, this value is going to increase and effectively RMS prop is going to scale down our learning rate. Uh, and, how, and, and, and for the same case, if our uh, expect running mean is decreasing, it basically means that we are going away from the local optima, all the local maxima of our loss surface, and what we need to do is we need to scale up our uh, learning rate. Um, so RMS prop, uh, uh, RMS prop adaptively scales the gradient to reduce the chance of um, overshooting the minima or maxima of your uh, loss surface. One of the most common and one of the most widely used optimizers uh, is the ADAM optimizer. ADAM optimizer stands for uh, adaptive moment estimation, and it captures both the, the positive things of RMS prop and ADAGRAD. ADAGRAD is, an, is another optimization technique that we are not going to discuss right now, but um, feel free to explore it and uh, come up with different things that we can maybe use in uh, homework as well. Um, but ADAM is one of the most commonly used optimizers, and throughout this course, uh, ADAM would be more the most widely used optimizers that you will use, and we'll see right now why. Um, it's because in, uh, if you're just taking the first moment of your gradients, and let's suppose you have a big network. So once you're, once you're back, back propagating through that big network of yours, you are multiplying it with all the gradients and then you are updating your first, first layer. So the update for the first layer is generally very small. 
and that basically means that you are neglecting all the information that you are, you, you are not acquiring a lot of information for the first layer. So the updates for the first layer is, they're unstable in, in the initial few things. Um, and what Adam does is instead of just taking the first moment of the gradients, it also takes in the account the second moment of the gradients. And it uses both these gradients to update the learning rate. So uh, the, the main, the main, uh, the main formula or the main uh, equation through which we are updating our weights is pretty similar for Adam and RMS prop. As we can see in RMS prop, we are taking the expectation of our gradients. Could be second moment as well. Could be first moment as well. But in Adam, what we are doing is we are adding the. Uh, 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 we are taking in account the both the moment of uh, the first moment and the second moment, and based on the uh, and, and keeping a running mean of it, and then uh, updating our learning rate based on that. So beta one, beta two are just the parameters that you are using uh, to. Uh, keep the, uh, the running mean and running variances. It, this beta is uh, similar to the alpha that you have got in the batch normalization class in the homework one part one. This is pretty similar to that because you are, you are using with, so this is basically a fraction and you're saying that with beta 1% of fraction, I'm going to keep the previous update I had and one minus beta, I'm going to take in the new gradient that I got from this particular batch. Um, and, and, and after performing uh, multiple gradient descents and multi mul after performing different, uh, after, after seeing the performance of Adam on different tasks, uh, the default parameters for Adam generally is that the learning rate is 1e minus 3, beta 1 is set to uh, 0.9, and beta 2 is set to 0.999. Yes? I'm sorry? Uh, MT and VT? Uh, yeah, yeah. So MT and VT are just different, uh, you are uh, capturing the running means of the first moment and the second moment of your gradient there. So it's pretty similar to um, what you are doing in batch normalization also in homework one part one, if you remember. So in your, in your running mean, what you're doing is running mean times a particular beta plus one minus beta times the new mean that you are going to get, the new gradient that you are going to get. Uh, so that's that you're, you're, you're finding the expectation of your gradients. Um, and MT and VT are first and second moment. As you can see, it's, it's multiplied twice. Um, uh, a, a frequent question is when to use which optimization. Um, uh, to be really frank, there is no correct answer to this, uh, but um, uh, there are certain intuitions that you should know. And the, when one of them is, if you're starting to increase the number of layers in your network, what you're doing is you're increasing the number of parameters in your network. And what basically means that once you back propagate, the updates that you are going to get will be much more shallower because you're compounding it with the learning rate and with all the gradients that you have calculated uh, in the, in, in the uh, latter part of the network. So with bigger networks, the problem of vanishing gradients increases. And with, vanishing, with, the, with this problem, it is generally recommended that you do not use something like SGD because this, it's not really taking into account all the moments properly. So uh, that is one. And uh, for some tasks that have uh, temporal associativity, for example, uh, for some tasks in which you need to input the network, the output that you got from the previous time step. And, and for example, in some tasks, you need to have the time dimension as well, as we are going to see in the ladder, uh, ladder homeworks as well. And you have an additional time dimension. And based on that time dimension, you are feeding the output of your neural network back again in the network. Uh, so in such cases in which you have temporal associativity, you also have the problem of exploding gradients, which we are going to see. And for such problems also, it is generally recommended that you use something that is acquiring in enough information, uh, optimizers like Adam, RMS prop and stuff. Um, but again, there's no fixed answer to this. Um, depends on the task, depends on uh, multiple other things. Um, now, uh, what we, so th these were some of the optimization techniques that we discussed. Now. For hyperparameter tuning, um, there are multiple, multiple ways through which you can do that. Um, uh, grid search being uh, number one. So grid search is a, a very simple technique in which uh, you know the hyperparameters that you want to tune. For example, you know that I want to tune my learning rate, I want to tune uh, some of the, uh, I want to tune the beta for my momentum or stuff like that. And what you do is you just create a subset yourself uh, and uh, what you say is, uh, for, for learning rates, I want to check how my network is performing for point, uh, 0, 0, 0.001, point 0.01, and point 0.1. And uh, you also have, uh, you also said something like that for different parameters for beta and other hyperparameters. And what you do is you, it's, it's, it's just, uh, 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 it's a problem of complementary, uh, it's just a problem that you just try with all the different permutations and combinations that you can make with all the different hyperparameters and come up with the combination of hyperparameters that's the best. Uh, the good thing about this is you can do this in parallel because each and every setting is independent. Uh, 
So uh, 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 your model of point uh, with a learning rate of one e minus three is different from your model with one e minus two. So you can run those in parallel and see which performs uh, better. The bad thing is that, of course, you are yourself defining the, sub, uh, the hyperparameters, and it is possible that you're missing the hyperparameter, which is really required for you to reach the local, uh, uh, which is required for you to reach the global minima of your loss surface. Uh, uh, the, uh, from, uh, apart from grid search, there's another uh, 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 a technique known as random search, and in this, you just randomly uh, state and you just uh, go and randomly select a particular hyperparameter to uh, hyper hyperparameter and then you tune it and you find different type of parameters randomly there's no subset you just uh, go in an open space it will take much more time however uh, it's it's known to be much more effective than grid search because you're taking in a different number of hyperparameters uh, there's another um, hyperparameter tuning method uh, a Bayesian method of doing that and in this what you do is for all the hyperparameters that you have in, a, in your network, you map those to a particular function. And what you try and do is you try and optimize that particular function. So uh, once you optimize that particular function, you're basically optimizing all the hyperparameters in that particular equation you have. And this optimization problem itself could be solved through uh, Bayesian methods like Bayesian re linear regression uh, and other, uh, other Bayesian techniques. Um, uh, now we'll be moving on to so along with optimizations and hyperparameter tuning, one very important stuff that uh, we'll see later in the notebook as well is how you initialize your parameters, how you initialize your weights uh, primarily in the network. Um, so let's start with a particular question. Um, uh, what we have been doing in homework in part one is that we have been uh, uh, initializing our weights as zero uh, matrices, right? So what do you think? Is, this, is, it, is it a good way to initialize our weight matrix to zero? What happens when we initialize our weight matrix to zero? Let's assume that it's the first batch. You start the training. It's the first batch that you ever uh, sent in the network. What happens? Every neuron tends to be identical. Exactly. Every neuron tends to be identical. More importantly, what you're doing in, the, let's, in, 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 in uh, a multilayer perceptron, what you're doing is you're just uh, multiplying your input x by the weight matrix, adding a bias, ap applying an activation function on top of it. If your weights are 0 and your biases are 0, no matter what the input is, your FX, uh, Wx plus b is zero. You apply any activation function, depends if you're applying sigmoid or something like that, it'll have a different value, but if you're applying, for example, let's suppose ReLU, it'll still be zero. And that zero is again been fed in the next layer, which is multiplied by zero, plus zero, which is again zero, and so on and so forth. So for the first batch, it's all zeros. Now, the good thing is now you want to find the probability distribution of it, so you're using softmax for it. So once you apply softmax over all zeros, a vector of zeros, you get equal probability for all the different uh, vectors. Now because you get equal probability, it basically means your network knows nothing, and it's just ran it's giving equal probability to all. And for the first batch, it gets the original probability distribution, finds the loss, does the cross, if you're using cross entropy, finds the loss, and then finds the gradient. Now, if it, when it finds that particular gradient, you are updating your weight matrices with that gradient. But once you, once you have multiple layers and you start going inside the first and the second layers, you need to multiply that with the weight matrix itself. And initially, the weight matrix is set to zero. So the gradients also are set to zero. And for a lot of epochs, uh, after a lot of epochs, your weight matrices start to, to get a value which makes even sense, because uh, initially, it's all just zeros. Um, so what, what we can do is maybe instead of not initializing it with zeros, we can initialize it to a constant value. Uh, but then the problem that uh, you just mentioned, then we'll be having the same gradients. Uh, initially, we'll have same and zero, but if we, have, if we initialize it with the same values, we'll be getting the same gradients because, uh, yeah. Isn't it better to initialize it with zero and have like the original data distribution of the labels? Essentially, what you're backpropagating mm -hmm. would be the difference between your labels mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you'll have the same distribution as the labels essentially, at least in the n minus one s layer. Yeah. And then gradually over time, that same distribution is going to go back. Instead, if we go by random, mm -hmm. it could essentially go in a completely different dimension as well. Right? That's a that's a, that's a good way of initializing your biases. Yeah, that that is a good way. You can randomly initialize your bias uh, uh, equally, and you can start with that. And uh, it is actually a good way to uh, get loss, uh, get a better loss faster. In, uh, oh, so you're using your, in, you're not initializing it with equal probab, e equal uh, weights? If we have zero, right? Yeah. During the first round of backpropagation, essentially we have the same distribution in the weight matrix. 
distribution the n-1 is clear mm -hmm. as the as what the labels represent because everything was of equal probability okay but if things are randomly initialized mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it could go in a completely different dimension. Right? Uh, by labels, you mean the original labels, right? Yeah, of the training data. Yeah, of the training data, you know the original labels. If you have zeros, the problem with that is, yeah, for the first batch, you are giving equal probability, and then you will be uh, upload, uh, updating your uh, weight matrices and stuff. But once you backpropagate through the other layers also that you have in the network, you will essentially be not updating them at all, because once you multiply them with the... But over time, it will just be slow, but the distribution will be maintained. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Okay. You cannot really say. It depends on how you initialize it. But yeah, it'll, it'll take time to converge, and which is a big problem uh, uh, in in the in the networks. And, and if you have bigger networks, it's a big problem. So you want something that really converges faster. Um, so instead of having zeros, we can initialize with a particular value. But the problem of having same gradients uh, persists. So there are different ways to uh, initialize it. Uh, one of it being just random. You can maybe use a Gaussian. Uh, uh, distribution to update your weights, uh, to initialize your weights, sorry. Um, there are also techniques like Xavier. Uh, you can also pre-train your weights, uh, make, make use of the pre-trained weights, um, or, and also you can just apply custom initialization to the weights. Um, uh, one of the most important initialization technique is the Xavier initialization, um, and uh, and we'll, we'll see why it is. So, um, uh, what we need to make sure at each layer of our network is to maintain the variance that we have in the that the in, through the variance of the input that we have and we need to make sure that the variance that we are getting in the network needs to be equal to the variance that we are outputting for a particular layer as well because in that case we are going to acquire and make use of all the uh, we, we are, we'll, we'll be basically uh, 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 keeping track of all the variances now what in this particular equation, this the first equation is y equals just summation of w i x i. This is basically uh, each neuron in a particular layer. That's what it does. It just multiplies your w i's with x i's. Um, now, what we want is we want to keep the variance of y, and we need to uh, 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 we need uh, if we calculate the variance of y here, um, and we do the math. What we can do, and we if and we when we set the variance of y to be equal to variance of x, um, what we'll come up with for variance of w is basically just one by n. So if we initialize our particular weights by instead of zeros or just equal values, but just one by n, where n are the total number of neurons in the layer, um, the, the variance of my input and output uh, would remain same. And we can thus say that uh, we are taking into account all the things. But in our neurons, we know that the number of inputs that we get are not equal to the number of outputs necessarily. So what we can, so uh, this original, this the, the equation that has been mentioned there was originally, uh, originally thought for neural networks itself. And now what we do is instead of doing just one by n, we do two divided by the total number of inputs that we have in a particular neuron and the outputs that we have in a particular neuron. And we just sum it up. And we take, because uh, because that's the variance, and when we have to find the standard deviation, sigma being standard deviation, we take an under root of it. This initialization is known as Xavier initialization, because, um, and, and in this you are taking into account the equal variance of input and the uh, out, output. Um, so, um, so these are the different initialization techniques. Now let's see how they really perform uh, uh, in, the, in the notebook. Um, by, by maintaining same variance, what I'm trying to uh, intuitively make sense is uh, if I have, let's suppose, two uh, neurons in my network, right? Uh, those two neurons need to effectively make sure that the, any input that I'm going, getting from the previous layer uh, needs to be taken into account properly. What I can do is maybe just increase my weights, and so that when when whatever input I'm getting, I'm just able to multiply them properly and make sure that uh, my output remains like that. For but if I have a large number of neurons in my particular layer, uh, what I would want is to have uh, smaller weights for all the different neurons. And if we have smaller weights for all the uh, neurons, we are making sure that we are having enough variance for each of the different neurons, and uh, which in turn is going to propagate whatever output we get, uh, in, which in turn is going to propagate whatever input we get uh, through the network. So if that is the case, um, and if we make that, you, and, we, and if we set that variance of x, our input equals to uh, uh, variance of y, 
uh, we get that particular equation, which basically makes sense. If you have two neurons, you, you initialize them as one by n and one by n, which is 0.5. You have larger weights for it. But if you have 10 neurons or maybe 100 neurons, you want to equally give opportunity to each neuron to fire and propagate the information forward, So, which is, again, one by n. OK. Um, so the, for the so the, for the purpose of this tutorial, we are going to be uh, we are going to use PyTorch, and uh, uh, we'll see first uh, how it performs with different optimizers optimization techniques that we have discussed. So uh, uh, here I'm just uh, 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 importing all the libraries that are required, um, and the and the data set that we are going to be using in this particular uh, recitation is the fashion MNIST. So it's pretty similar, the characteristics of the input, the data, the, the data that we have is pretty similar to the original MNIST data. The fact that the images are still 28 cross 28, so you have 784 neurons in your input. Um, also, the number of labels, labels uh, that's constant. You have 10 labels. Um, and uh, you have single color images, and you have centered objects, and you have 50,000 training and 10,000 testing images. Um, so, 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 so this particular uh, uh, cell is just, uh, we, we are initializing a class to uh, load the data set that we have. And these are the different labels that we have um, uh, uh, in the fashion MS data set. Um, the, we have train data and test data. And if you we, if we, if we try to see some random examples from the fashion MNIST, these are the random examples that we see. We have trousers, sandals, and stuff like that. Um, now, what we want to see is the performance of different optimization. So for the sake of doing that, we are just going to initialize uh, a very simple multi-layer perceptron. We'll have three layers, and uh, they'll have 64, 32, and then finally just 10 number of neurons in each one of them. Uh, and uh, as we can see in the forward function, we are just taking the log softmax because um, uh, that's going to work with the uh, cross entropy loss that we'll uh, use. Um, now, in, uh, for, a, for a simple optimizer in PyTorch, we, uh, there is uh, there's, there's a resemblance with what we have done in homework one part one. We all have the step function in PyTorch, which basically does the same thing that we have been doing in homework one part one, which basically updates the gradients that you have. And uh, for different optimizers, step function is the only function in which you have you see the see a lot of difference um, because the way that we are updating our weights gets different. That, that, that's what we discussed in the slides. Uh, there are different ways of adaptively changing learning rates and stuff like that. So the step function is basically different for all the different classes that we have um, for. Uh, uh, yeah, all the different classes that we uh, have for the different optimizers. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, we, uh, I'm going to write a simple, uh, uh, a, a, a different simple function that is going to a simple class, a trainer class, which is going to do all the calculations for us, all the forward and the backward propagations and calculate the loss for us. Um, th this is uh, the strain loader, validation loader, and test loader is nothing but uh, the uh, loading of the data that we have. And now, uh, this is the training module that we are going to use. And in this particular trainer class, we, uh, the constructor of the main class only has a, a model that we are going to input, the model parameters they're going to be, and an optimizer that we are going to uh, uh, send in the class. So it can be Adam, SGD, RMS prop, whatever. The run function is the function that is uh, basically going to do all the training for you. So in that, for each epoch, you're going to forward propagate, get the loss, do the stuff that you have been doing in the train statistics function in homework one part one. Um, so you do this. And uh, um, for, 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 so for, to see how the performance is for all the different optimizers, we're just going to initially, run, um, I mean, normally distribute all the weights in our layers. Um, and uh, let's run it for eight epochs. So, now that it's training, uh, it is, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm initializing an optimizer for SGD, I'm then initializing an optimizer for Adam, and then I'm initializing an optimizer for RMS prop, and then we are going to see how the loss is going to converge. Um, so now that it's training, uh, uh, if what we are doing to see how the model is performing is just printing the loss. But uh, in the later recitation, specifically the next recitation that we'll have, we'll also see there are different ways to visualize and evaluate how your model is performing. Um, instead of just logging a particular loss value uh, on your console. Uh, so we can see that for an SGD optimizers, it starts with something point with of 0 0.12, and then it's reaching the, to a loss of 0 0.016. Um, uh, with an Adam optimizer, it's starting at a higher uh, loss. But uh, as you can see, it is uh, converging faster for, 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 for Adam. Um, and uh, in epoch, it's, it's reaching a particular value. Um, I'm just going to let it run. It's going to take maybe a minute or two. 
um, and then we can see how 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 it performs. But it's going um, speed is similar to what we assumed. That, but it does not necessarily mean that the uh, and what we'll be seeing in the later recitation is that even if your loss decreases pretty quickly or if it converges pretty quickly, it doesn't really mean that you are going to classify uh, and have a better accuracy in your model. Um, Um, so for Adam, it is reaching um, uh, uh, a loss of 0 0.007, and something similar is going to happen for RMS prop as well because the data set is not that complex, and RMS prop and Adam effectively do the same thing. Um, instead, of the fact that Adam, of course, uses second moments as well. Um, Um, so yeah, so these are the loss values that we have, and these are the uh, accuracies that we are getting for different optimizers. And as expected, SGD is a, is a little slow to converge, uh, but Adam and RMS prob uh, converges faster. And f for this particular example, they're getting higher accuracies as well. Um, if you simply just plot the training losses, we can see that for uh, so, so the first one being uh, SGD, Adam, and RMS prop, uh, we can see that the training loss is is, is, is much lower for RMS and Adam. Um, now. Uh, not con no, now this is for this, this these are the things for optimize different optimization techniques now if we if we see the same thing uh, for different parameters so what we are doing here is we are um, uh, making a function which is in which is taking the entire module in as the input and what we are seeing that if the particular type of my layer in PyTorch is linear then I'm going to apply the weights that I have uh, 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 then I'm going to apply a particular weight and initialize the weights. Um, so I can do that, if, for example, in this case, we, what I'm doing is I'm initializing it with a normal distribution, so they are normal weights. Um, uh, it, we can also do custom initialization, and a custom initialization means that basically you could have stored your weights somewhere, and you can just basically uh, load them up and use those weights. Um, uh, uh, it, for this particular example, I'm just using dot copy underscore to just copy the weights. It's going to be the exact same weights. Um, uh, for Xavier, uh, as we discussed, it's going to be uh, it's going to take into account the number of uh, inputs for the, uh, it's going to take into account both the input of a particular weight matrix and the output. So what I'm doing here is fan in and fan out are basically going to be the uh, two dimensions of the weight matrices. I'm going to add them up and I'm just going to take the square root uh, of, the, uh, of the entire fraction, two divided by the total number of inputs and outputs. Um, and, and that's it, then that's going to be my standard deviation. That's what we, we came up with. Um, uh, I, I, I am just applying that particular thing here, and uh, let's just train. Let's just see how uh, it's going to perform for just three epochs for the same uh, optimizer, Adam, and different parameter initialization. So, with if you're initializing a normal, uh, uh, if you're initializing a weights normally, you can see that we have a fairly decent uh, decreasing loss, but. Uh, if we are using Xavier, you could see how our loss starts with, because uh, we are not. That's what that's what we were discussing, right? That if we have normally or if we have zero weights, it is going to take much more time for your network to start learning something. But with Xavier initialization, you are making uh, making sure that uh, your weights are initialized to a proper value, and so that it starts learning quickly, and which is really really important, and which you will be seeing that in a lot of homeworks as well. That it is important for you to initialize the weights properly, or else uh, for a task that can generally take five to 10 minutes for, any, uh, for you to get decent results, you'll be spending like two hours for it, even on a GPU to get decent results because you're not initializing your weights properly. So it's really important to, that you do that. Um, and, and if you see that, uh, that's, that's what the training loss is. Uh, along with that, you can also use, make use of the pre-trained weights. So here, what I have is, um, uh, a network famously known as AlexNet, and I'm just I can use and I can just copy the weights and load the weights in memory if I have a pre-trained model and make use of it if I have an architecture similar to AlexNet for my task as well. Um, now uh, I guess Anushree is going to cover the, some other uh, techniques for optimization. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, um, so the next section of the recitation will cover mostly the techniques and some of the um, optimization methods that you could be using uh, while training your model and more importantly when you're trying to tune your model. So especially for like all homework, uh, all the part two, all the Kaggle competitions that you will be ta uh, taking part in, you'll spend a lot of time trying to hyper tune your model. So, um, so I'll be trying to cover like some of the things that you can use and you can like see to like prevent things like overfitting and in general like to see how your model is performing. So I'm sure like all of you kind of uh, went through, had to implement momentum as part of homework one, part one. So um, the main thing that you need to remember about momentum is that it is a way to kind of accelerate your uh, convergence and also make sure that your gradients are moving in the right direction. Right, and um, so let's just quickly move to the Jupyter notebook. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. So you. Uh, so for momentum, like the way we do it in PyTorch is that. Uh, if you're using SGD, right? So you, it's as simple as just passing a parameter when you're uh, creating your optimizer, right? So here you define a momentum parameter and you define like what is the decay. So this value that you're giving in here is essentially, if you look at the equation, is this one. So this is like the decay rate that you're trying to give to your momentum. And your learning rate will be the learning rate that you have set for the model. Um, so the, the other thing is like batch normalization. So again, batch normalization you've all implemented in homework, uh, homework one, part one, and essentially what you're trying to do is that you're trying to kind of reduce the amount by which the values of your hidden, hidden units shift. And the way you're doing it is like taking the mean and then subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, right? So an, uh, another important thing to remember is that batch norm also kind of do, does some sort of regularization, because think about it, like what are you doing with batch norm? You're just kind of trying to add some noise to that particular layer, right? So you're trying to like uh, uh, make sure that the model does not like overfit. So you're trying to make uh, the model kind of like, so even if you think of like, um, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that batch norm like completely uh, helps in uh, overfitting, but it does add like some sort of regularization to the network. So, um, so when I cover dropout, I'll, I'll come back to like see how to, to tell you like how you can use batch norm and dropout together. Um, okay, moving on. So, when you're training your network, especially like for the Kaggle competitions, you will have to. Most of you will encounter overfitting. So, what happens during overfitting? So, your model is training, and it 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 kind of overfits on the training data, which means. In, apart from learning the important characteristics of your training data, it's also learning the noise in your training data. And therefore, when you make it, when you like kind of make predictions on like some unseen data or on your dev set, you will, you will see that your accuracies are going really low. So there are different ways in which you can kind of tackle overfitting. And the most predominant ones are like um, adding dropouts to your layer using like regular, regularization parameters. So, um, Dropout. So what happens in dropout is that in a given layer, you're going to randomly sample out some neurons. So um, if I give you an example, like let's say that there are two neurons in a particular layer, and this particular neuron is kind of making like 80% correct predictions, and this neuron at this point is making just like some sort of random predictions, right? So but when you like, because it's a fully connected layer, so you will have like both the neurons, this neuron kind of co-adapting into like what the first neuron is predicting. And it's kind of like, this guy's really not learning much, right? So what happens in a dropout is like, you could just kind of like, when you're randomly drop, uh, kind of getting rid of neurons, right? You just drop out some neurons. So this guy's alone now, okay? And he's going to try to learn. So you're removing that co-adaptation that's going to be there in that particular layer, and you're forcing the neurons to learn. So this happens with like each batch, and your neurons tend to learn better without kind of being dependent on each other. So this is how you kind of reduce the overfitting, because your new neurons are learning better, okay? So, um, Okay, so now coming back to when, where I mentioned like you can use batch norm and dropout. So when you're training your network, what you would normally do is you have your input layer and then you have your batch norm. 
and then you can follow that with like a dropout. Okay, so uh, and if you're using a, a batch normalization, you can use lower values for your dropout, and um, or if you're not going to use a batch normalization, you can use like slightly higher parameter values in terms of like uh, what probability of the neurons you're 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 trying to drop in that particular layer. Can you just zoom in the particular Oh, it's oh really? Okay. Sure. Is this okay? Yeah, I mean, it's basically for students. Oh, on the video? Yeah. I hope this is okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, and um, and there is also regularization, right? So what? So what does regularization do? So you're trying to add some kind of regularization or some sort of weighting to your loss function where you're trying to penalize your uh, loss function to make sure that it does not overfit. So you're trying to, so especially in the case of like when you're having like vanishing gradients. When, so what is a vanishing gradient problem? So your gradients, your network is, not, is so huge that when, you have, you're, when you're multiplying over all your gradients, the gradients become so small that they're extremely close to zero. So the gradients are typically vanishing, right? So you add your regularization parameter so that this case does not happen. And you're trying to make sure that uh, your, um, uh, your loss function, like there is some value to it and it gets back propagated. Um, so, okay, so this is just a rule of thumb. So like the more training examples you have, the weaker this term should, this term should be because if you have more training examples in your, your network kind of, has more data to learn from. Okay, so in PyTorch, this is typically like how you would use uh, batch norm and dropout. So it is very similar to the initial MLP that we saw. So you have a linear uh, layer, you have, you're following it by a batch norm. So in uh, PyTorch, you, you have batch norm 1D, batch norm 2D. So the, the main difference between that is batch norm 1D would kind of uh, do a batch norm over a 2D or a 3D uh, dimension of your input, and uh, batch norm 2D would do like over a 4D dimension of your input. So you will know as your input is coming in and as you kind of define your architecture whether or not you need to use 1D or 2D. Um, so yeah, so the only thing that will change in your forward function is that you will be doing like a batch norm and um, I think so you can add like a dropout yep so um so you can actually try to run the models so so here like we have set uh, we've give, so weight TK is nothing but your uh, is equivalent to your L2 no, L2 regularizer, okay? So you can mention the weight decay parameter here, and it will act as your L2 regularization to your loss. So um, so basically here, like in this Jupyter notebook, like I would suggest, just go and make changes to all these parameters, and um, uh, try to add more layers, try to add dropouts, batch norms, see how they work. You can also plot like uh, the training metrics for both your validation and your train losses. Just see how they work and try to understand like how tuning different hyperparameters will affect your network. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, gradient clipping. So initially, in the beginning of the recitation, we heard about uh, explosive gradients, right? So let me just go back to the slide deck. Okay, it's here. <coughs> okay. So, um, in gradient clipping, we have our gradients accumulated and they are so large that when we are trying to kind of um, converge or we're trying to go down the landscape to find our local minima, we overshoot. So if this is the landscape, you, you can see that our gradients are like, have increased so much at this point that we are overshooting the landscape. And we are literally missing the local minima that we are supposed to converge at. 
So this is a gradient explosion problem. And the way we kind of try to like overcome it is like we're going to clip the gradients to a threshold. So your accumulated gradients, just before you make your step update, you're going to set a threshold and you're going to clip the gradients to that. So that will ensure that you're actually, uh, you're not going to overshoot and you're actually going to like fall down and go, go in the right direction to your optimization function to find your local minima. So that's kind of the main objective of doing the gradient clipping. And um, the way you would do it in PyTorch, like there are different ways to do it. And this is one of the ways to do it, where you take all your model parameters and you kind of define like the value at which you want to like uh, clip. And uh, it's, it's just as simple as that. But the most important thing is that you need, to you need to use this before you do your step, your optimizer dot step, which is your step updates, OK? <laughs> Um, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about was this. Okay, yeah. So what, how did you come up with that parameter? Why did you use that? It's a hyperparameter. So I mean, it is basically something that you would you can normally people use it between like 0.25 to 0.6, and 0.7 ish. But it is it really depends because you you need to know like how deep your network is and like your your gradients. When they accumulate, it really kind of varies between different architectures. And you need to kind of make sure, like you wouldn't, for example, you wouldn't want to have a very high value to clip your gradient right when you start training and when you have a smaller network, right? So you, do, you want to make sure that that does not happen. So it's kind of something that you monitor and you see how your network is working. Like, for example, the way I would do it is like, as I'm monitoring the network, so I'm, I'm going to keep looking at my training losses. I'm going to be looking at my validation losses. And I see that I'm overfitting, okay? which means I've missed a minima. Right? So there could be many reasons that I've done. I could have overshot it. right? I could have been, you know, uh, my, my neurons might, might, might not be learning. right? We might not, they might be overfitting to the data. There could be a lot of reasons. right? So in that case, like, I would initially start with trying to like, clip, use, use a threshold, and then see what happens. Okay, did I reach my minima this time? Did I not overfit so soon? So these are the things that you kind of try to like gauge as and when you're training your network. So there is no definitive answer to that question. Yeah, yeah, it's really very good. It depends on the task. It is possible that for a particular uh, task, your gradients are stretching out, and uh, you need to get them to a particular value. You need to see what your gradients actually are instead of just going with a going with a random value of 0.25 or 1 or 2. But these are the values that are generally that generally work. But it's really, really important that you, instead of directly just randomly selecting a particular value, just see how your gradients are working at that time and then clip it. Because sometimes 0.25 might be a little too strong yeah. for some tasks. Yeah. You might want to adjust it to 1. So they're really empirical. How do you, how do you tell how your gradients are doing? You can, you can actually print. And you, can, you can print that. And you can check. And then we'll see how we can visualize the entire model. Because currently, how we are visualizing the model is just through the loss. Basically, evaluating what our model is doing is through the loss. But that's not really the best way of doing it. We need to see how our gradients are performing. If adding a particular layer is really helping anything, or maybe even if we add a particular layer, the gradients for both the layers are just same. So we need to see that how our gradients are also performing. And we'll see in the next presentation actually how do we how do we do that. Yeah. So um Yeah, sure. On um, this clipping, are we clipping the some kind of based on some kind of norm? Yes. Yes. So basically what happens is like you can imagine as having a single vector. <laughs> with all the gradients so far. And then you're kind of taking a norm, and uh, you're trying to like clip based on that norm. So, so. You're, you're resizing them appropriately? Like no, you're not. Every entry is resized? Or are you just clipping like every derivative? You're clipping every derivative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. OK, so the other thing um, is early stopping. And so when you're training your network, and in fact, as part of homework on part one, if you've completed the training stats part of it. So you initially train a model, and then you kind of validate on it, right? So you would want to know that when you're training, like how many epochs do I train for? Like when is my model good? Like if you just like train a model for like 20 epochs versus 10 epochs, it might have overfitted somewhere in the middle, and you would never know. So it's very important that you like kind of set a stopping condition. And the way you can do that is like as you're training for each epoch, do a validation in the same epoch, and then try to see if your like validation accuracies are actually going up or are they going down. So even if your training accuracy is high, if your validation accuracy starts to decrease, 
just stop. Okay, have a stopping condition, something you need to like change your model your, because your network has overfitted, right? So you need to make some changes. Either you need to change the architecture or uh, change the number of neurons in each layer or whatever different hyperparameters that you want to change. So early stopping is a way to kind of figuring out how many epochs do I need, really need to run. So the way you can do that is like, like I said, like have the validation do a, do a val dev set, do a validation on the dev set as you're training. Um, okay, so let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook. Okay, um, so this is another important thing that kind of really helped me when I was training and a lot of us, and it's the annealing learning rate. So as you're training the model, you set a learning rate, right, in the beginning, and that kind of remains constant throughout. But, so imagine a case where you're kind of <coughs> training and at a point, like because of the learning rate that you have, you have set, you might have just skipped the minima and you're, trying to, you're starting to overfit. So but you want to like, if you had just reduced the learning rate a little bit, you might have just captured that local minima. So the idea behind doing an annealing learning rate is something like this. There are different ways of doing it. You can do like a step uh, decay annealing learning rate or you can do like an exponential decay. But the objective is that with a step decay, for example, and that's what's commonly used, is that decrease the learning rate by a certain, num by a certain amount after every, say, five epochs or 10 epochs. Or you could also do something like after every 100 mini batches. So this function here is something that you can use. And uh, initially, you have set your learning rate to something. And then you need to define like by what you want to drop and by what value you want to drop, and after how many epochs. So you call this function while you're training, right? So you call it like uh, at the end of like say, ten, you just check, okay, after the 10th epoch, call the step decay function, reduce the learning rate. So the, the normal, the norm of doing it is like you start from like a higher value like 0.1, and then like after five epochs, just reduce it to like 0 0.01, and then 0 0.001. So what happens is that if you're, if you're converging to a local minima, you're reducing, so it, you make sure that you kind of actually hit the local minima and just because of a higher learning rate, you don't kind of miss it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the objective behind having like an annealing learning rate. Um, yeah. Kind of, yeah. So like, like Shivam spoke about Adam, right? So in Adam, basically, the learning rate, it adaptively changes by itself to for if different parameters. So um, at times, despite that, you will still have to do an annealing learning rate. So it's kind of an optimization technique. They do have the same objective, you're right. But it, you will have to like still reduce the learning rate in order to do that. Yeah, momentum is slightly different. Like, because in momentum, you're, you're kind of like denoising so that you kind of go towards your original function. But uh, it, it also used to like accelerate your uh, uh, convergence. But this is more like you're trying to capture that local minima that you would have missed because of some change in learning rate. So there is like a subtle difference, but essentially all of them have the same objective. But despite using Adam, like, out of experience, like you still have to use an annealing rate. So, yeah, it's just like a rule of thumb. Um, so I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, yep. So, questions? Cool. Yeah. Yes, we will post it on the website after the recitation. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And good luck with part two if you haven't started it yet. <laughs>